This talk is uh, organized into six parts. We begin by reviewing the phenomenal success of Python and its wider ecosystem. Then we take a look at um, Project Jupyter, uh, which is another very successful software initiative. And we look in particular at Jupyter Notebooks and the Jupyter Lab integrated development environment. We then describe how we've taken these ideas of Python, Jupyter, and Jupyter Lab into um, embedded systems. And that gives rise to the RFSOC PINK framework. And we show one of the um, current examples of the benefits you can derive with RFSOC PINK by showing how you can use techniques from um, the open source community to do rapid prototyping of RFSOC designs uh, with dashboards. Of RFSOC designs uh, with dashboards. So let's begin by reviewing the Python ecosystem. Python has rapidly become one of the most important programming languages in use today. It's the default choice of uh, data analysts and many scientists. There are many reasons for this success. Python is an open source programming language. It was designed from the start to be easy to learn and easy to teach. Uh, it's an interactive, dynamically typed language. It has a huge ecosystem, um, thousands and thousands of, of packages that can be installed by the user. This makes for a very productive environment. It supports agile software development and critically interoperates well with other programming languages, especially C and C++. And more recently, it's being adopted extremely widely by a programming language of choice in many courses. This slide from uh, an article by the uh, IEEE Spectrum magazine dates to July uh, 2018. And what's particularly surprising about it is that Python has emerged as a language for embedded design. In this graphic, it's a, a listing of the popularity of different programming languages. Um, it shows the, under types, the, the application areas for the different languages. So the first symbol indicates uh, the World Wide Web. The next symbol indicates a cell phone or mobile applications. Then there's desktop. And the little um, IC style symbol indicates embedded programming. Now, traditionally, C and C++ have dominated embedded programming. But as of 2018, the IEEE writers were pointing to, and this was a somewhat surprising result um, until you dig a little bit deeper and see how Python interacts with and interoperates with C and C++ so effectively. The quote, I came for the language, but I stayed for the community is attributed to Brett Cannon, who's one of the Python core developers. And uh, it's a statement he made in a keynote at PyCon 14. And it's a very telling statement because it talks to why so many people find the uh, Python language, the Python community, and the Python ecosystem so powerful. The uh, table here shows the rate of growth in uh, activity and packages in the Python ecosystem between the years 2006 and 2018. And um, you see here that the number of new packages, if we look at the compound annual growth rate, was in excess of 43% during annual growth rate, was in excess of 43% during those years. The number of active packages was higher than 47%, and there was 51% increase compound annually on new releases and 39% increase in new authors. These figures are frankly staggering. And if they were in the hardware world, we would call this a Moore's law effect, an exponential um, effect. So it can't be underestimated just how valuable this is to the growth of Python. The fact that there are so many packages, so many package developers, uh, packages continue to be maintained long after they're being developed and new authors are coming into the community. And so you can truly say that Python developers stand on the shoulders of the Python community. And this Python community is the equivalent of a, a big giant. And, and using um, 
Isaac Newton's words, I, I see further because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And you might wonder where all these package developers are coming from. You know, these, these are large, large uh, numbers. And the answer is they're not all new packages written in Python, but rather many of them are successful packages that have emerged from other programming communities uh, that have been written in C or C++ or even Fortran. And what has happened is that they are um, so valuable that people have taken the time to um, port them to Python by wrapping them in a Pythonic API and then releasing them into the Python community so that a naive user could be calling a new Python package that is doing some, giving him some or her some new functionality, whereas in fact what they're calling is a C program that's been wrapped in Python. And, and uh, this is a critical advantage uh, for the Python programming language. To develop this idea a little bit, observe a few properties of, of, of Python uh, and how important C is to it. The first is that Python itself is a C program. And many of the built-in modules, when you look a little bit more closely at Python, are actually written directly in C. As we noted earlier, many Python packages are written in other languages and then wrapped in Python APIs to reuse them. And in fact, if you look at the very popular and very substantial SciPy package, you'll find that approximately 17% of that Python package is written in pure Python. Now, when you want to wrap Python around C, it's important that you have a good interface that exists, but it's also important that you can exchange data efficiently uh, from a speed point of view and also from a memory point of view so that you have mechanisms like zero copy for the transfer of data between Python or C and C++. And these mechanisms have, exi and these mechanisms have existed for some time in the buffer protocol and in the um, NumPy ND array mechanism. Having looked briefly at the dramatic success of Python and the um, tremendous advantage it has through its community and, and ecosystem, let's turn our attention now to Project Jupyter which has its roots in the Python community also. Project Jupyter has its roots in IPython or Interactive Python. And Interactive Python is standard Python with an improved REPL, where the REPL is the read, evaluate, print loop. And basically two scientists were working quite a bit with Python and believe that they could improve its interface and, and do some more useful things with it if they borrowed some ideas from other environments like Mathematica and Sage. They wanted in particular, uh, and Sage, they wanted in particular uh, better interactivity, things like better uh, improved code introspection, uh, code completion. They wanted to be able to execute um, shell commands directly from their REPL. And they wanted to have better language interoperability and command and results caching. Being scientists who regularly um, did exploratory computing, they wanted to be able to visualize the results of their computations quickly. Uh, and this led to them wanting better plotting, uh, support for more MIME types, and, and more interactivity, interactivity in general with their, their visualizations. IPython was launched in 2001, and 10 years later, in 2011, um, IPython notebooks were launched. And the notebook was a radically new idea where um, you took a browser page, a browser window, and you uh, code and the results of executing the code in the same window, along with all the other rich media artifacts that you would like to have in a notebook. So you could do um, videos, images, LaTeX equations, uh, markdown text alongside your Python code and your results from executing that code and the interactive visualizations that you had generated uh, with your computations. And this became hugely successful. Um, many other groups looked at uh, IPython notebooks and thought this was a really cool idea and investigated how it might be used with other programming languages. And as we'll see shortly, the architecture evolved to support this, uh, so much so that the name was deliberately changed from IPython notebooks to Jupyter notebooks, where Jupyter is a contraction of three programming languages that were popularly used with the notebooks in the early days, 
uh, Julia from MIT, Python, and the R statistics. This new metaphor for um, doing interactive computing was motivated by the need for reproducible science. The authors of, of IPython had um, been very frustrated by the fact that so much of the science reported in papers and published papers was very difficult to reproduce. And they wanted an artifact that would not only describe um, the work that scientists had done, but also uh, allow somebody else to get a copy of the work and reproduce it and um, test it for themselves, validate it, extend it, um, verify it, etc. And that's where the concept of the Jupyter Notebook was born. And today, this is hugely popular, uh, particularly amongst the data science and machine learning and AI communities. And it's taught to hundreds of thousands of college students every year in many, many different disciplines. Despite their popularity, Jupyter Notebooks lacked many of the features of regular software, software integrated development environments. To rectify this, Jupyter Lab, the next generation user interface for Project Jupyter, was launched as an industry academic collaborative effort in 2018. Jupyter Lab remains a browser based environment. Each um, pane within the window is a single program and is uh, a plugin like any other uh, program that's running in another pane. They're all equal clients of the browser environment. And now you can have a Jupyter notebook executing in one pane within your Jupyter Lab browser. And you can have the other types of tools that you would expect in your integrated development environment in other panes. So you would have text editors, you would have uh, shell interfaces, you would have visualization programs and any other uh, type of program that you might encounter in a typical IDE. As the results of a survey, as the results of a survey performed by Kaggle, in 2020 show, Jupyter Lab quickly became very popular with data scientists. It became one of the most popular IDEs used in AI and machine learning applications. The vendors of other leading IDEs such as Visual Studio and PyCharm were quick to recognize the importance of Jupyter Notebooks and to provide support within their proprietary IDEs for notebooks. So you can see that both Visual Studio and PyCharm today extensively support Jupyter Notebooks in their IDEs. And in general, as science and engineering are increasingly data-driven or increasingly becoming big data, you can see that the importance of tools that support ML, AI, and data science in general Become more. We see this applying also in embedded computing applications where the amount of computing, where the amount of data processing is increasing all the time, where the data rates are going up and up, where the number of channels are increasing. And of course, this is extremely evident in software defined radio, mobile communications, uh, etc. And something we see especially with devices like RF SOC. So we see that the tools that the regular data scientist has are tools that we would like to have in our RSSOC environment. Jupyter's customer facing capabilities are very impressive, but what is equally impressive is the underlying system architecture. We see here a graphic depicting how the original terminal IPython essentially morphed into a new architecture with two distinct components, a front end and a back end. Now the back end is a language server and allows you to have Python or which is running and effectively to serve up um, the computation to the front end. The front, front end, in contrast, is a browser based environment um, with notebook support and it serves the user facing interfaces such as the notebook and, and the um, JupyterLab IDE. One of the key characteristics of this environment is its modularity and its use of standard um, message protocols and interfacing techniques. So we see that JSON messages, JavaScript, object notation format, which is widely used and supported in the industry are deployed. We see that it uses other standards like HTTP and web sockets, which are widely used. Um, in the back end, zero MQ sockets are used. And zero MQ is 
not as common as some of the other formats, but it's widely used. It's a cross between an embedded networking library and a, a concurrency framework. And it, it offers it that carry messages, atomic messages um, across various transports. And, and it can be in process, inter process, over TCP IP, multicast, etc. And to give an idea of just how successful it is, it has APIs for over 20 languages, and you'll find it deep within the um, uh, software stacks of, of many commercial projects. One of the key decisions in architecting Jupyter was to adopt a browser-based front end. And in effect, this makes the platform independent of any target system on which it's hosted. All I need is a browser to connect to uh, the back end, and that back end may be local or it may be uh, at a distance over the network. And I'm not dependent on the uh, windowing system of a particular operating system because I'm using browsers, and browsers are essentially um, the universal windowing system of today. And of course, the browser is a very competitive environment, the universal windowing system of today. And of course, the browser is a very competitive environment with many major players offering competitive products in there, such as um, Google and, and, and uh, Apple and Microsoft, and is heavily standardized. Uh, it uh, depends on standards like scalable vector graphics, uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And um, this is an extremely good way to ensure that your architecture will remain as open uh, as possible for as long as possible. Another key benefit of the way that Jupyter has been architected is that it's um, highly modularized. Uh, things can be decoupled easily. Uh, it's extensible. And this has led to many, many experiments with different front ends. For example, Google's Colab is a front end for uh, Jupyter. Um, virtually all major companies offer um, their AI front ends, and they can customize and update or adapt the environment uh, as they see fit. In 2017, Jupyter's architecture was awarded the ACM, the Association of Computing Machineries, Software System Award. And this is um, akin to the Nobel Prize uh, for Software Systems. Um, to put it into context, this prize has been won by Unix, by um, Eclipse, uh, by TCPIP, uh, and by Java. So it's a very, very prestigious award. And all the more so when you consider that the design of Jupyter uh, came from two scientists, not two computer scientists, but rather a physicist and applied mathematician. And it's a testament to the excellence of the architecture that it would be honored in this way. This slide illustrates two points very nicely. The first is the, and you can see from the graphic that 12 million notebooks apparently, approximately in six years have been posted onto GitHub. Now what's rather nice about this is that the analysis of the activity on GitHub, the notebook activity, is itself done in a Jupyter notebook. And you can go to GitHub and run the notebook at any point in time, and the notebook will update and tell you what the updated statistics are. And it will also use some AI techniques to predict future growth. And this is exactly the kind of reproducible science that the architects of Jupyter hoped to achieve in the first place. So it's a delightfully recursive example of best practice uh, with Jupyter Notebooks, illustrating the uh, success of the notebooks. We have described um, some very successful software projects, including Python and Jupyter. We are envious of what has been achieved by the software engineers and would really like to have the advantages and capabilities that they have uh, and take them and apply them to platforms like RFSOC. And that is what RFSOC Pink attempts to do. It creates a Jupyter um, lab environment and Jupyter notebook support integrated with the RFSOC platforms. So the first thing that RFSOC Pink does is to embed Jupyter lab on the ARM application processors in the RFSOC device. So you can see from the partition here that we have the server and the kernels now running under Linux on the ARM A53s. And when one connects to the board over TCP IP 
from any platform of choice that supports a browser, we can interact with the board independently of the operating system that we're using uh, at any time. Interact with the board independently of the operating system that we're using uh, at any time. Running JupyterLab natively on the RFSOC ARM A53 processors is the first step in creating RFSOC Pink. The second major step is to create Pythonic APIs for all of the hard IP cores that we find in the RFSOC itself and also in the overlays that are loaded into the FPGA. What is a Pythonic API in, in this context? Well, the essence of it is that the API for the hardware should behave as though it was an API for any regular Python package. One thing we've done is to extend Python's package installer pip so that it now supports fat binaries that include software and bit streams. So we can load new software and the associated bit streams and the configurations of the hard IP in a single. We also extract overlay metadata um, for the overlays that have been loaded. And we can from this create an IP dictionary that allows us to interactively query parameters of the IP, such as the address range or the registers uh, that it may have. And we call this hardware introspection and liken it to the software introspection that would be supported with regular IPython. We also do convenience functions that are typical of the way that Python would approach um, managing systems. Uh, we find and set the clock frequency specified in the metadata for the PC subsystem. Uh, we assign memory mapped uh, user space Linux drivers for any IP that doesn't have a driver associated with it in the metadata. And this lets you interactively read and write register content um, even before you have uh, a Linux driver for a piece of IP. And this is a very Pythonic approach where we try to anticipate what the user will need, try to give them as much do so automatically, and then let them further extend the capabilities in any ways that they would like to. This slide shows in slightly more detail how the RFSOC Pink uh, framework is implemented. You're seeing here the Jupyter client and the IP, IPython kernel from the earlier diagrams. And we've expanded out the um, zero MQ ports that are part of the protocol between the client and, and the kernel. And in here, you see that the um, we're running IPython. And of course, with IPython, we have uh, several standard libraries like NumPy and Matplotlib, and of course, the user code. And in amongst these libraries is the pink library, which does the interfacing to the RSOC device, to the hard IP, and also to the overlay that is loaded in the FPGA fabric. The result is that we have JupyterLab IDE running on the RFSOC. So here we see an example of a Jupyter notebook with the hard IP of RFSOC and using the FPGA fabric as well. And in fact, you can see that the leftmost pane is actually a spectrum analyzer implemented on the RFSOC and made visible through a Jupyter notebook. The middle pane at the bottom is a frequency planning tool that again runs on the RFSOC. And you can see at the top where it says dashboard, we're actually showing the results of running the spectrum analyzer. So this is what happens when you take Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab uh, IDE and empower them, uh, transfer them, port them to the RFSOC environment. You start to get the same kinds of benefits and, and advantages that software programmers enjoy. This slide may be helpful to some viewers. Um, we are all pretty familiar with the idea of embedded web servers. Uh, those of us who have seen routers and, and laser printers and routers and, and laser printers and configured them over the network are very familiar with these kinds of uh, embedded web portals. And that technology has been around for a long time. And one of the benefits of it, of course, is that all of the rendering of the graphics are done on the client side. So the um, uh, Mac or the PC that you have used uh, uh, to access the router or the printer, uh, its browser uses the native graphics unit in your hardware to actually display um, the, the, the portal. So this is a very um, well-established technique. Actually, the same approach is what's used in um, JupyterLab. So when JupyterLab is running on your desktop, 
it's actually serving a web server and you attach to it locally with your browser and all the windows that you're using are essentially browser panes so it's a very similar concept we're not using the standard browser panes so it's a very similar concept we're not using the standard windows that one would normally use for applications on a pc or a desktop or a linux box we're using the browser interface so when we ported jupyter lab and jupyter notebooks to the rfsoc 2x2 and to other rfsoc platforms in effect we're enabling an on-target IDE um, via the web server that's running on the um, RFSOC. And essentially we're taking an environment that normally runs on a PC or a Mac and running it on an embedded target. And one of the key advantages of this is it allows us to have tools on the target that allow us to be much, much more uh, competent and, and, and productive um, in terms of how we use uh, it it reduces the need for uh, techniques like cross a few people um, are familiar with and we do this because we want to increase productivity and we see productivity really as two things ease of use and ease of reuse and of course we said earlier that jupiter is a mechanism for enabling reuse of scientific results we are exploiting that here to enable the reuse of engineering results So expanding on this topic of productivity, uh, PINK um, is Python for zinc productivity. We see that as being ease of use and ease of reuse. Um, On-target development is a key aspect of this. It saves a lot of time not having to go back to the um, external machine to do simple things. Uh, we want to be reproducible by executable notebooks. So for example, you can load a Python package which will bring a full spectrum analyzer uh, onto the RF SOC. It will have notebooks that you can interact with the um, spectrum analyzer using and it will have dashboards as well. We try to make the interfaces to the hard IP and other IP in the system as Pythonic as possible. Uh, we mentioned earlier that one of the strengths of Python is the ease with which you can transfer data uh, uh, between C programs and, and Python programs and also the ease with which you can write um, Python wrappers for C code, and we exploit this extensively um, in our SOC Pink. As we'll see in just a moment, we benefit from widgets for interactive visualization and for dashboards uh, for creating standalone uh, GUIs, and we'll show an example of this next. Uh, we mentioned that we do pip packaging of designs uh, and bit streams in, in fat binaries so that you can do pip install my spectrum analyzer, and everything that you require for that design will be installed. And finally, the project is completely open source. So all of these packages can be found in uh, open source GitHub trees. In this, the last part of the talk, I'll show you how we use um, two Python technologies, uh, IPython widgets and Voila, to rapidly create um, dashboards, or in our case, GUIs. Uh, since essentially dashboards are GUIs when you apply them to instruments rather than to static data. And this is an example that you'll see demonstrated this afternoon. Uh, we'll show this in the context of the spectrum analyzer. So it's something that you can try out yourself later. This is a magnified view of the spectrum analyzer notebook uh, that we saw in the um, earlier slide that featured um, RSOC Pink and the Jupyter Lab IDE. What you're seeing here is um, different cells. Uh, some cells are code cells, some cells are tech cells, other cells are. Uh, so in the um, top cell where it says RF tone generator, that's a widget that allows you to configure uh, the frequency at which the RSOC um, DAC will generate a tone uh, for testing with the RSOC uh, analyzer, spectrum analyzer. And what you're seeing in the lower diagram uh, is a display widget, also with some uh, control uh, widgets as well. And this is to display the results of capturing um, that um, tone with a RF ADC. So we can see that in our browser window, we have these widgets for uh, control, for display, visualization, etc. And because it's a browser, these widgets are written in JavaScript. 
but they're specified in Python. And hence they're called IPython widgets or IPy widgets. What's particularly nice about these widgets is that they sync between the notebook, the kernel, and the RSOC device. So for example, the frequency of the tone or the magnitude of the tone that I want to generate using the RF DAC, that command makes its way from JavaScript in the browser across the web to my uh, notebook server and to my IPython kernel, where it's dispatched by the interface that we showed you a little earlier into the RFSOX hard IP blocks so that the frequency and the amplitude of a particular RF DAC is changed in the way that we want. And then as we're monitoring the uh, output of the ADC channel, as that changes, our uh, changes are automatically percolated to the display widget in the browser window. Curiously, um, data analysts often have to report their results to their managers who are not programmers. And frequently they got requests from their managers not to see the results as notebooks, um, but instead as dashboards. And it's relatively frustrating to do a lot of and it's relatively frustrating to do a lot of computation in a notebook and then have to create a separate dashboard for your manager. So um, some clever software chaps uh, decided to automate the process of creating dashboards from Jupyter notebooks. And this is a very powerful technology because it means that we can take all the work we have invested in creating an interface in the notebook. And when we're ready to export just the interface portion, uh, we can do that semi-automatically. And we have taken this capability and used it to generate the user interface, the dashboard, if you will, for the spectrum analyzer and for other designs that we have created. So here's a preview of the spectrum analyzer that you will uh, hear more about this afternoon and you will see uh, demonstrated. And you can see its uh, front panel interface, its GUI, um, is actually generated using Voila Dashboard. And um, is actually generated using Voila Dashboard. And this is the uh, package that allows you to take a Jupyter Notebook and transform it into um, a, a dashboard representation. Now, this has uh, a black background, so it might not look uh, quite similar to the notebook that you saw earlier with a white background but that's simply a configuration option that you can change uh, as you see fit. What's even more impressive is that uh, in order to do this transformation from the notebook representation to the GUI representation, we actually only had to execute one um, voila command in our terminal window. And you can see that uh, that's the command highlighted in yellow here. It says voila and it gives voila the name of the uh, Jupyter notebook to convert and it gives them some options uh, about how to um, do that conversion and then the rest of the screen is updating us on the status of its progress as it makes the conversion so in summary we saw how python is rapidly becoming the linga franca of scientists data scientists and, and many many more engineers um, we saw how it's encroaching new territory like embedded systems and how its ability to interoperate with C and C++ in particular um, makes it able to um, be deployed in embedded applications. We saw that um, from the initial work in IPython, Jupyter Notebooks emerged, and this was motivated by uh, a desire for reproducible science to produce artifacts that could be uh, shared and validated with other people uh, and that could be uh, further refined and improved. And that this um, notebook concept be, uh, became exponential in its growth and is one of the most um, phenomenal open source projects of, of the last decade. Notebooks had some deficiencies and, and one key deficiency was that they didn't address the capabilities that a traditional software integrated development environment would offer. So Jupyter Lab was launched as a project with academia and industry to combine the merits of notebooks and traditional IDEs. Meanwhile, the um, commercial vendors extended their IDEs, Visual Studio and PyCharm, to provide uh, extensive support for uh, Jupyter Notebooks also. And the RFSOC Pink project really is all about bringing these capabilities to RFSOC. RFSOC itself is a stellar product. 
It's a groundbreaking, innovative silicon platform that can redefine teaching, research, uh, software-defined radio, and, and many other areas. But we think combining it with the um, combining it with the Jupiter capabilities and embedding them so that the RF SOC capabilities SOC capabilities are presented Pythonically within a Python environment with suitable APIs is a very powerful and very compelling vision. And um, that's primarily what we have done uh, in the RFSOC 2x2 project. And then finally, the benefits um, of on-target development, uh, the unprecedented ease of use, the productivity, uh, the reuse. Uh, we hope that some of the examples we've shown you of how we can rapidly generate GUIs by reusing technology that was created by data scientists to satisfy their managers is quite compelling and uh, could be used by um, and has already been used by project students and researchers in academia. Once again, thank you for your time and attention. Um, we hope you find the RS Pink vision compelling. Uh, we hope that you'll join us on the journey to use it and uh, further extend it and uh, further extend it and uh, to explore new applications in academia and research and teaching. Thank you.